for that theory. Uh, we kind of expected there would be a great crowd and we're very, very happy to have you here. Uh, welcome to Book Passage as always. We thank you for supporting independent <coughs> bookstores like ours. I've got a couple of housekeeping things to mention during which if you can check your cell phones and make sure they're on silent or turned off. And while I'm looking at the tops of your heads, uh, if you haven't had a chance to pick up a copy of David's book, it's available at all the registers that you passed on your way in tonight. And in about an hour or so, after some presentation and Q&A, you'll have a chance to buy a copy. And once you pay for it, bring it on back in here, and he will be signing uh, next to me. My name is Dana Kelly, but I'm thinking of changing it to Chef because this is my third outing with these people. Um, I don't know if any of you were here for, uh, for Beautiful Boy. Thank you. I love that noise. Um, uh, with, with both David and his son, Nick, uh, I was, I was uh, uh, pleased to host um, that event. Uh, I also hosted Nick when he was here for, for his book, Tweak, uh, and here we are again. So welcome to the, uh, the Chef Family Bookstore and uh, Author <laughs> Events Outlet uh, with David uh, tonight. Um, this is not a memoir tonight, but this is the result of those memoirs. This is the result of what he went through and all the research that he did uh, in order to try and find answers to uh, how to lick. Uh, his son's addiction, and among the things you're going to find out tonight, some of you may know this, I'm just going to pull a couple things out, and, and you may know this uh, already, that, that these are a couple things from the book. Addiction is the worst problem in America, the cause of more deaths than any other non-natural cause. One in 12 Americans are addicted, more than 30 million people, and a new study shows how much that fact hurts our competitiveness in global markets. Um, there's also uh, a real a cogent argument here about various kinds of treatments, uh, including AA, uh, that possibly AA may not be the best way to deal with this because among other things, quote, addiction is a disease, not a moral failing. And finally, something I did not know, researchers have discovered that when addicts get off drugs, they essentially return to their mental state at the time they first started using. Mm -hmm. So an adult uh, who's been using since he was 13 will return to that psychological age, and people have to deal with that. Um, let's see, oh, a couple of quick uh, reviews. One of these is from someone you'll know, Sir Richard Branson, who's the founder and chairman of Virgin Group, but he's also a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. And of tonight's book, Clean, he says, Clean is an important expose of a failed system. By replacing it, we will save countless lives, help people get clean and stay clean, and help the U.S. end its catastrophic war on drugs, to which I would add the war on drugs was never a war in the first place. And also uh, from Benoit Denizet Lewis, who is the author of American Anonymous, who says, clean is a blueprint for thinking clearly and empathetically about America's costliest and most misunderstood public health crisis. Our guest tonight is David Sheff, as I said, he's, also, he's the author of the number one uh, New York Times bestselling memoir, Beautiful Boy, which was an account of his struggle to save his son Nick from addiction. He's also the author of several works of journalism. His writing has appeared about everywhere you can imagine, uh, including the New York Times, Wired, Fortune, Rolling Stone, Outside, and the LA Times Magazine. His ongoing research and reporting on the science of addiction earned him a place on Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people, and we managed to get him to come down from Inverness to be with us tonight. <laughs> to please welcome David Sheff. Well, thank you, Dana. It's, 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 uh, I've been traveling around uh, the country for about three weeks. Uh, it's coming, coming home, uh, uh, not just coming home to Marin, but coming home to Book Passage. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, when they, uh, my, besides being my hometown, um, my home county, uh, it's also the place of uh, where, I, where I'm. Uh, I have this 
the people that are the most important people in my life here, and some of them are here tonight. And so thank you to Nancy and Don, my, my mother and father-in-law, and my sister-in-law Susan, and my other good friends who are here. Um, well, as Dana said, you know, we, Nick, Nick and I were here, my son and I were here about, it was about five years ago. And um, that was because uh, a book that I wrote um, was published, and it was a book that I had never, ever conceived of. Uh, I, I had no interest at all in anything related to the subject uh, of drugs or addiction. Um, and you know, I was a, I was a journalist uh, writing about you know business and art and politics and other things. Uh, and uh, I had I had this image, I guess I think an image that many people have of what um, drug addiction is and what drug addicts look like. Um, and they didn't certainly look like my son, uh, my son Nick, my my beautiful boy. Um, he was uh, he was uh, just I think like so many of our children when we finally become parents. You know, it was transformative for me. Uh, I was living sort of a you know single person's selfish life, and suddenly I had this child, and um, and everything changed, and it changed in the most wonderful way. Uh, everything got quieter, and my world got smaller, and Everything became focused on this, like this lovely being who, who you know, in the morning would wake up and with this like brightness and looking out into the world and and um, with with you know all this excitement and hope and uh, potential for the future. Um, and you know, as he grew up, we did what you know we lived, first we lived in Berkeley um, and. And we went to the park and we went to the zoo and you know we started preschool over there and we moved to San Francisco and then when he was actually in the fifth grade we moved um, we moved to Marin first to Sausalito and then to uh, Inverness and as he grew up um, you know he was this great kid uh, and we had um, you know what I thought was a different kind of relationship that than certainly than I had with my parents I mean my parents were very loving and, and uh, and uh, we're, we're great parents, but our generation, I think my generation, looked at parenting in a way differently. Uh, we had a different kind of, in fact, we called it parenting. It was, before it was just having kids, but we really did everything really <laughs> self-consciously. We wanted to be the best parents that ever existed. We wanted to have, you know, just to do everything right and to have very special and meaningful and close relationships with our kids. And uh, I thought that's what my relationship with Nick was like. Uh, uh, we talked about everything. We did so much together. Uh, there had been a tough, tough time in, in his life when he was about three years old, when his mom and I uh, had a divorce, and it was not an easy divorce, and I know that that was really traumatic for him. Um, but he seemed to be doing fine as he went forward and as he was growing up. And so it was a complete shock, and I was um, just really blindsided when he was in, I guess he was in the seventh, no, in the eighth grade, and I opened up his backpack, and I was going to get a sweater or something, and, and inside I found a bag of marijuana, um, and I was just—I was blown away. Um, not because you know I naive about drugs. I mean I know the seduction of drugs, and I know the ubiquity. I know uh, you know I grew up with drugs. I I used drugs. Um, I had friends who um, you know who who whose lives were destroyed by drugs. So I wasn't in any way, um, I wasn't clueless, but I was clueless to the fact that my 12-year-old, I mean, he seemed so young, he was 12. Uh, and it just broke my heart, and it broke my heart also because of this whole idea that I thought that we were, you know, that we had such a different kind of relationship with a father and a son. I thought I would know what was going on in his life, and I realized then that there was a, a world that I, I wasn't part of. Um, and I guess because I had those experiences with friends who had serious drug problems, uh, I didn't just sort of, you know, just say, you know, what a lot of parents say, and uh, uh, which is, you know, a lot of kids smoke pot, it's fine, it's not a big deal. Uh, a lot of kids drink. It's part of our culture, you know, in, in, in Marin. Um, with anybody who's surprised about, you know, the amount of drug uses. Is, isn't just paying attention. So it's it's not it, it's not that. Um, 
But I felt um, uh, because of the serious you know, problems that my friends had, I was worried. And I took it seriously. I didn't just shrug it off. And I went and I talked to his teacher at school. And I went and talked to a school counselor. And I actually brought him <coughs> to see a therapist. And they all told me the same thing. Uh, and they told me exactly what I wanted to hear. Uh, they said, Nick is a great kid. Um, he's, you know, he's smart. He's popular. He's got friends. He's a good student. Um, he's an athlete, whatever. Those, those measures are that tell us from the outside how our kids are doing. And they said, you know, Nick is doing great. Um, Kids try drugs, it's, they're around, it's, um, uh, Nick's fine, and he'll be fine, don't worry. Um, but Nick wasn't fine. <clears throat> um, his drug use escalated. It escalated uh, so that um, uh, by the time he was, you know, in, 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 uh, when he was a freshman, he was smoking pot, and, and he got caught smoking pot. He was um, uh, almost kicked out of school. Um, they gave him one more chance. Uh, as he was a sophomore uh, and a junior, his drug use escalated. Uh, he talks about, now he talks about when he looks back, um, he said that you know, on the outside, as I said, I, we have this way of looking at our kids and we look at them from the outside and we have this list that we check off and it tells us how our, our kids are doing. And, you know, again, according to that list, that checklist, those external barometers, Nick was doing great, you know. He was still a good student. He was still a, um, you know, he was a, on the, he was the captain of the water polo team, and he was on the swim team, and he was a, on the school newspaper, and he won a big award for his writing. Um, so this was going on even as he was in high school, uh, using uh, more and more drugs uh, to the point that he said that um, even as he was, you know, not, none of this. Uh, I, I had, I didn't, nobody knew because he always showed us kind of what we wanted to see and he still did well in school and he still showed up at practices and he still did his homework. But in the meantime, he says that at a certain point, um, what appeared to be this sort of ease and lightness and sort of ability to navigate life, to just go through and to you know, be sort of a teenager having a good time, um, it was masking something else that he felt, which was this deep anxiety this uncomfortableness inside that he said um, was something that he had always lived with. Uh, he'd always felt this, 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 this maybe sort of this low grade depression, this, this uncomfortableness that finally when he finally started to smoke pot and to drink, it lifted. Um, but he said that it lifted and it was easier for him to deal with things. He was at school, he felt like he wasn't so much the other, he didn't feel quite as weird. He said that it gave him a little more confidence than he'd had so that if there was, you know, he talked about this you know, girl that he'd been checking out for his whole, you know, first couple of years in high school and was too terrified to ever say anything and he got high and he was able to go talk to her. And so it, it sort of gave him all these things, but he said that marijuana and alcohol, uh, though it provided that, there was still this piece missing. And he said that it was very conscious at some point after a couple of years in school, and as in, in high school, when he said he, he decided actively to go out and find something else to try other drugs. And uh, over those next couple of years, he tried them. He tried ecstasy, and he tried psychedelics, and he tried um, uh, 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 most pills that you can name. And then he said that when somebody he was at a party one night, and somebody said to him, you know, would you like to try some speed? Uh, he would have said yes to whatever it was, but he, he said yes without having any idea what it was. And um, he said that he took this drug and everything changed. He said all of that insecurity, all of that depression, all of that uncertainty uh, just melted away and suddenly he felt everything he'd always wanted to feel, which was confident and powerful and handsome and, and sort of like he could do anything. Um, and he said that, that was, there was no going back at that point. Um, he didn't know it at the time, but the drug that he had tried um, was methamphetamine. Um, I, throughout those years, I, I would know sometimes that things were, I would get worried, there were, you know, Nick would be moody sometimes. Um, and I, he would, you know, we're parents, I think we are, we so badly want our kids to be okay that we are, you know, I think, it's, I think denial is, is, is 
and we're wired for denial. I mean, we don't want to see the truth when the truth is going to cause us pain and anxiety, and we are going to have to make choices that we are incapable of, of, of making. And so, I, looking back, I see all the signs that Nick was in serious trouble. But at the time, I would see that he was in trouble, and I would see he was, you know, maybe he was doing not quite as well in school. He was shifting friends. Um, he was getting more moody, sort of more sullen, more, uh, he'd go hide in his room. Uh, uh, we weren't so connected with him <clears throat> or his friends. And um, uh, so I, I saw these things, but then something would happen that, you know, that, you know, he would write something great and he'd get a lot of, a work, of, of attention for it and, um, or, or he had a, um, you know, there was a school play, and he had this fabulous part in the play, and there was all this, you know, this uh, attention for that. Or he would come home uh, uh, after school one day, and he would sit down and, you know, spend hours playing with his little brother and sister, Daisy and Jasper, and they'd build castles. And, you know, I, I would be sitting on the side and say, oh, you know, what a great kid, he's fine. And, um, excuse me. Um, and, and all the worries would, would be put away because they were too scary. Um, those worries, um, uh, there, there was no more denial, finally, when on a Friday night, Nick was supposed to be home at midnight, um, and it was midnight, and, and uh, he, he, he hadn't shown up, um, and then it was 12.30, and then it was um, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning, and, and Karen, my wife, and I were up in the kitchen, uh, drinking tea, and I'm getting mad, and I'm thinking, God, is he in trouble? You know, he blew his curfew, and he's going to be grounded. Um, uh, and then it was 1 o'clock, and then it was 2 o'clock, and then I got more worried, of course, and I got on the phone, and I started to make phone calls. Um, I called the, his friends, I called his friend's parents, um, I called the sheriff's department, you know, where we lived, thinking maybe there had been an accident, and I called uh, the emergency room more in general to see if maybe he ended up there. Uh, and there was no sign of him, no one had any idea where he was. Uh, and then it was 3 o'clock, and then it was 4 o'clock, and then it was 5 o'clock, and I made those phone calls again and again. And any parent who's been there, you know, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, you don't know where your child is, uh, knows the horror. And that went on for the full night, and at uh, whatever it was, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, Daisy and Jasper, you know, woke up and came padding into the kitchen, uh, and they looked at their mom and dad, and we're sitting there, um, and we are, uh, you know, they, they know something's wrong. Uh, and Jasper said, uh, you know, where, where's Nick? And um, and of course the answer was that we didn't know. Um, that nightmare lasted another day, and another day, and another day. Uh, where was Nick? Uh, I, 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 was, I made those phone calls over and over again. I called the police, I called the hospital, I called everyone I could think of. No one had seen him, no one knew who he was. Um, I imagined, of course, all the, all the worst things that, um, that could ever happen to a child. Finally, the phone rang about after after those about three and a half days, almost four days, and uh, Nick did call, uh, and he sounded terrible, and he told me where he was, and um, he was actually in San Rafael, in an alleyway, and I, I went to get him, and when I found him, he was sort of passed out behind a garbage a dumpster, and I went and I kind of helped him get up, and he looked like he was going to die, and he felt like he could break in two. He was so fragile and so brittle, and he was emaciated. He was shaking, and I got him in the car, and um, uh, yeah, my denial vanished. I, I saw finally that my son was going to die if I didn't do something. Uh, so I got him in the car. He fell asleep. I drove home, put him in bed at, at home, and then I got on the phone, and that's when I... Um, I began to learn what a disaster, what we call a, uh, an addiction care system, a mental health care system in America is. Um, uh, I, I was at, I hadn't slept, I was completely freaked out, I was terrified, I was petrified, I didn't know. And I was calling people and I was hearing, uh, you know, one person said, well you have to kick him out. 
you have to pack up his stuff, throw it on the you know front step, and tell him he has to leave uh, until he gets sober, and and uh, and and you know then you can talk to him about maybe allowing him to come home. Uh, someone told me to send him to boot camp, you know, a military boot camp that'll straighten him out. Uh, over and over again, people. Somebody told me to send him to a um, a, a, a herbal sort of vitamin therapy program in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> um, I had no idea. The, whatever somebody said, I said, okay, if that's what helped, yeah, that's what I need to do. Uh, uh, so anyway, I finally decided that somebody told me about a, a friend of a friend of a friend, their child had been addicted and uh, sounded like Nick and he went to a program and it had helped him. So I called the program, they had a bed, they took our insurance. Uh, so I, threw, I packed Nick's stuff up, I put it in a suitcase and I went to wake him up. And I said, um, yeah, let's, let's go. I've got some place where they'll help you. And um, he looked at me and said, yeah, what, what are you talking about? And I, I said, yeah, I'm going to take you to this place where you can get treatment. And he said, no, I was stupid. I will never you know, do that again. I'll, I'll never take methamphetamine and whatever other drugs he had taken that time. He said, but I'm fine. I don't need... But to me, I was, uh, he was, I was so scared at that point that I said, no, Nick, you have to go. You almost died. Uh, and he grabbed um, a couple, uh, uh, some of his clothes, and he grabbed a, a guitar, and he left. Uh, and again, there was another day and another night, and another day and another night. Uh, uh, finally, Nick called again, and finally, he was in terrible shape again, and finally, um, I did get him into a program. And I dropped him off, it was in San Francisco, I dropped him off and I checked him in and I sat in the car and I was, on one hand I was relieved because I knew where he was and I felt he was in a place where he would get help, but I also felt that I had somehow abandoned him, that I was almost feeding him to the wolves. Um, uh, you know, still after everything we've been through, like this is the people that I, those people looked like drug addicts when I walked into that place, but that, not Nick. Um, and I, um, anyway, I sat in the car and I wept and then, but I, but I, I, I was, I came home and I slept that night because I knew where he was. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll bear this for 28 days. It was a 28 day program. I'll pick him up in 28 days and we'll go back to our lives. This will be over. Um, Nick will go back at that point. He was already planning to go to college. Uh, he'll go off to college. Or the lives we had planned until we took this little detour will be, um, we'll, we'll go on. Um, and of course, uh, that's not what happened. Uh, I picked him up in 28 days and he was, he seemed like he was in great spirits and he was really committed to staying sober. Uh, and three days later, he left again. And those, years that followed, or, you know, that's what I wrote about in Beautiful Boy, it was this four, five, six year uh, of, of hell trying to uh, figure out what could help my son who was on this course that was going to lead him to death. It was not a question. Um, finally, I would sometimes be able to get him into treatment. Uh, he would do better for a while. Um, he would come out. Again, he'd be committed to staying sober. Uh, he would do fine for a week, for two weeks, for a month, maybe once, you know, for a few months, um, and then he would relapse. And every time I thought things couldn't get worse, uh, they did. Uh, those phone calls I was making in the middle of the night uh, continued, and, uh, and I got some, too. Um, those calls that parents dread, the phone ringing you know, at four o'clock in the morning and our breathing stops. And um, it's this disembodied voice on the phone. And, and uh, one time it was a doctor calling me from an emergency room. We said, uh, Mr. Chef, uh, we have your son here. You better get down. We don't know if he's going to make it for the next uh, couple hours. Uh, and another time a doctor called and told me that he was going to have to, they thought they were going to have to amputate Nick's arm because it had been infected from shooting drugs. Um, so it got worse, and he would go on the streets and he got in more and more terrible situations. He broke into our home. I once called the police um, to file a report and to, um, a, 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 it was inconceivable to me. What had happened? 
in our lives that I was calling the police to tell them that my son was a threat to our family. I had the locks changed on our, on our house. There were warrants out for his arrest. Uh, uh, but eventually, this struggle of, of, of relapse and this cycle of relapse and, and, and recovery and relapse and then back in recovery and relapse over and over again, he was doing better for a period of time. Um, and uh, I had uh, really taken a break pretty much from working for those, those years. I mean, I still had to do some stories to just make some money and survive, but I hadn't been focusing on anything. But at this point, I was going to go back and do some other writing that I planned beforehand. Um, but something had happened to us, and I felt that I um, wasn't able to let it go. And I talked to Nick about how he felt about um, about me writing about what 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 we've been through, and I talked to Karen and Nick's mom, and um, this idea that I, I I felt that there was this um, there was this uh, really sort of dangerous uh, denial that was uh, just that it, it wasn't just in our family when a, a parent looking at a child, but it was. Um, it was with, with all of us, everyone I knew who felt, you know, we have this image of what addiction looks like, again, what drug addicts look like, the people that we might see, you know, in certain parts of, of, uh, of Marin or in San Francisco, and we probably cross the street because, uh, you know, we avert our eyes. Um, uh, but, but I learned that, um, that, you know, drug addicts can look like any of our children, and I felt that it was important to say that. Uh, we thought this could never happen to us. It did, and I now know that it can happen to anyone. Uh, so I wrote this story, I wrote it for the Times, and it came out, and then that led to Beautiful Boy, sort of more of the same. It's, it's, it was not just about, um, about sort of this, this, uh, this awareness that this is something that we all need to know about, and we all need to pay attention to, but also uh, this sort of relentless nature of this of this problem and how you know this um, how how we're, li we're we're living in a culture that you know gives us a clear course for us to help someone we love who have who has any other disease has any other illness but here we're in the dark um, so anyway so I wrote I wrote beautiful boy uh, and it came out and um, my intention then was to go back to write this book about architecture that I was planning to write. But but um, but something changed then, and, and it, I think it's changed um, uh, my life for, for, for good. And, and that was um, when when Beautiful Boy came out, uh, a door opened, and um, it's a door uh, to a world that I really didn't know existed. Because even when we were going through this, I felt that I think it's I think it's a common. It's common to people who are dealing with addiction in their families. We 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 don't talk about it. You know, we, we keep it a secret. We keep it hidden because of the shame and the guilt. You know, what what would people think about me that my son was um, had become an addict? And I wanted, or, or what would they think of Nick? And I I wanted to keep um, people's favorable impressions of him. So we didn't talk about it, uh, and so we don't talk about it. Um, and yet, some, somehow, this, you know, this book came out, and, and I'm hearing from people, and I'm hearing from, you know, from people on the streets, and then I'm hearing from people in mail, and, and through mail and email, and over the phone, and I'm getting letters forwarded by the publisher over and over and over again um, from people who are, um, they're saying basically the different versions of the same thing. They're saying, um, we don't talk about this. Some of my best friends, some of the people in my family don't know about it. People I work with who are sitting at the next cubicle who I've known for 30 years don't know what's happening in our family. But somehow you got into our home um, and you live, you've been living with us. Uh, and um, except for a few details, your story, your family story is our family story. I heard it over and over and over again. And I also heard more times than I can imagine from people who said, you know, your family story is our family story, except ours had a different conclusion. Uh, my beautiful daughter uh, died, or my lovely son didn't make it. 
Um, I, I met these people. I went on a book tour with Nick uh, for, for Beautiful Boy, and when his book, uh, Tweet, came out, we went on a book tour together. And we would be in communities all over the country, and people would come up to talk. And before they said a word, people would, be, I, you, you could just see it in their face. People who have suffered so much, their lives have been changed forever, in many cases destroyed. Um, people who either were then themselves suffering because they were addicted, or their husband or their wife or their brother or their sister or their parents or their child uh, was addicted. Uh, they didn't know where they were or else they had died. Um, so, you know, it's, there was no going back to the book about architecture that I was planning to write. Um, <laughs> I had to figure out, you know, what is this problem that we are not talking about that is devastating so many people and people are suffering and they're suffering in silence. Um, and so uh, I, I spent um, I spent the next, uh, uh, since then, really, I've, uh, trying to figure out what is addiction? What is addiction? Why are we so inept at preventing this disease? Why are we so unable, or so rarely able to treat this disease? Uh, and I tried to figure it out. I tried to get answers to those questions. And most of all, I wanted to know if there was something that we could be doing better. Uh, there, I guess I, I, I just, well, first of all, I learned more about, about what we were dealing with. Um, and some of it is told in numbers. Um, you know, 20 million people are addicted. 100 million people in our, in our country you know, have someone in their family, directly in their family, who's addicted. Um, we're losing 350 people every single day. 350 people. Um, addiction is the number three killer in America, uh, the number one killer that is not a natural disease like, like a, or a natural death like cancer or heart disease. Um, it costs America you know, $420 billion a year in healthcare costs and criminal justice costs and lost productivity. Um, and there's not any way to measure the, uh, the suffering. Uh, when people have an illness, when we have an illness, when someone we love has an illness, it is terrifying, it is overwhelming, it is the saddest thing in the world. Um, but with addiction, it's worse. And the reason it's worse is because uh, people are not blamed when they get cancer. Um, I suppose smokers may be, but if, if, if People aren't blamed you know, if a child gets leukemia or if a child has another terrible illness. Um, all we experience, all we do is, all we feel, and all it, it, it is compassion. They just get love and they get compassion and they get support. But there, with this disease, um, there is judgment and there is blame and there is um, uh, it, when people get the disease, they are blamed because there is an assumption that is, um, it's so widely and deeply ingrained, uh, felt throughout, uh, throughout people that it always still astonishes me, but that people think that this is a choice, that people are making a choice to use drugs, and so it's their fault um, if they end up addicted and if they end up breaking into people's homes and if they end up uh, in, in jail or uh, in, um, on the streets or in the emergency room. Uh, the suffering, I, was, I, I didn't want to talk too long. I want to have a chance to, to talk and to hear if anybody has anything to say about their own experiences with this. But yeah, I was going to read some of the stories of people that I, I met through the course of researching this book. I spent a lot of time with researchers and doctors and in rehabs and in 12-step meetings and in um, psychiatrist offices and with patients in in outpatient programs and inpatients, but most of all, the most, um, the, the thing, the, the part of my experience over the last years that was the most affecting of, of me and, and the most um, meaningful and the part of it that will always stay with me is the relationships I develop with people and the stories are, so, so the, 
horror of the deaths and of the, of the illness of, of the families and of the people who are afflicted with this disease are just immeasurable. Um, and I felt this everywhere I went. The sadness is almost unbearable. Um, it is unbearable. Um, but then the other thing that I found as I traveled around and as I did this research and I went to uh, meet people who spend their lives trying to understand this disease and to try to fix uh, the uh, treatment system, um, is that there are these places of light uh, around the, the country. And, and I found them um, uh, in unexpected places. And I found them, uh, first of all, I guess I found them in my own education as I went forward. Because I heard when I was in, when Nick was in rehabs, I would often hear the counselors talk about the disease of addiction. But I think I was like most people who heard it over and over again, but when I really thought about it, I didn't buy it. Um, again, I know what a disease looks like. I know what it looks like when somebody is ill. And it did not look like someone breaking into my home. Uh, it did not look like someone who had become this you know, moral person, this kind, loving person, my child, who had suddenly um, uh, you know, was, was had a worn out for his arrest and was dealing drugs and was doing just unconscionable things. So that's not what a disease looked like. Um, but as I became educated, I began to understand that, uh, that this is a disease that is a disease like every other disease that has biological components. This one also has psychological components and it has environmental influences. But but it's a disease like every other disease, except the reason that it also is related to this, um, this, uh, this crazy, crazy behavior is because it's a bra brain disease. And people become addicted, their brains are different, their brains process drugs differently, they operate differently, and all the things that you know, we sort of make, the assumptions that we make about the way that people make choices go out the window. People, uh, people uh, were, a friend of mine just wrote something on, on um, online about this whole issue about uh, addiction as a, as a choice. And um, the responses were just this very like, kind of, cr I, I was so, I still am so surprised, but it was all about, you know, you're letting these people off the hook by saying that this is a disease. Uh, it's a choice. You know, nobody forces anybody to go out and use drugs. Nobody forces anybody. And, and you know, the fact is, is it's true that nobody forces anybody, nobody forced Nick to go out and have uh, smoke a joint after school, or to, uh, nobody forces a kid who goes to a party on a Friday night uh, to drink. But um, but you know, of, of those ten kids who are going to go out and have a drink, or uh, or take a pill, or or get high on a Friday night, you know, what eight of them, nine of them are going to go out and they'll use drugs somewhat moderately, probably throughout their lives, or some will stop on their own. Some might have some problem, but it won't take over their lives. But one or two of those kids will become addicted and their lives will go inexorably into this cycle of hell. And they chose they all chose to take that drug in the first place, but no one chooses to become no one chooses to become addicted. It's because their brains are different. Um, I saw scans of brains, I saw the research, I talked to so many researchers and pretty soon I came to understand that this is a disease. Um, the reason that is so important for me to know, and the reason it's so important for everyone to know, is when I talk about these places of life, it's that when you know that there is a disease, we have a model to follow. The model we follow when we treat diseases is pretty clear. It's a medical model. We go out, instead of, you know, uh, you, if somebody you know is sick, you don't kick them out mm -hmm. and wait until they're desperate to be helped. You don't send them to a boot camp to straighten up. You don't, I mean, for so many people who are ill, um, support groups and, and um, uh, spirituality is life-saving. It's incredibly important. It's incredibly powerful. But if you've got cancer, you also want to go to a doctor and figure out what's going on and get the best treatment possible. So, so when you understand that this is a disease, it's a disease, then we have a course to follow. And there are scientists out there, there are researchers who are breaking this disease down, understanding more and more about it, and lo and behold, they're coming up with treatments that work. Uh, on one hand, there is this enormous suffering. On the other hand, there's this, this profound body of knowledge that, of treatments that work. Um, 
but the problem is is that you know there's this huge gap between the two. There's there's this 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 uh, the, the, the people who need this treatment don't have access. Almost no one gets the treatment that they need. Um, there are some uh, signs that maybe that will change. And so this is another place where there was some light that I discovered. Um, one of them is, is a profound change. Um, in the book, I tell the story of a woman who was in Pennsylvania. Her daughter was like Nick, very much like Nick. She never went anywhere near as far with Nick with his drug use or the kind of crazy stuff that she did. But her daughter was addicted to heroin. And the mom finally was able to get a treatment program for her daughter. She got her into this program. It's the same thing. Thank God she's going to get help. The mom came home, and she got a call after um, after seven days from the, someone at the, uh, this hospital and was told, you know, um, you have to come get your, your your daughter. You have to come get Ashley. And the mom said, what are you talking about? And she said, um, you have to come pick her up. Um, your insurance was denied. And the mom said, I can't pick her up. She's... She, I just, it was hell getting her, and I'm sorry when your insurance is denied, uh, there's nothing we can do. So the mom went and got her, and Ashley came home, and uh, the mom got on the phone to try to figure out what else to do. Uh, and she went in to get Ashley for dinner, and um, her daughter had scored drugs and was dead, and she overdosed and died. Um, again, we talk about the medical model, this is a disease, um, would a hospital be able to, you know, kick someone with a serious illness after seven days. Oh, well, we know the medical care system isn't, there are problems, and I'm sure that even happens with, but this happens routinely with addiction, uh, with drug problems. And um, one of the really hopeful pieces that, uh, that may actually cause a really a fundamental monumental shift in bringing these two worlds together is that when the Affordable Care Act um, kicks in in January, uh, insurance companies will no longer be able to treat uh, substance abuse, addiction, uh, or other mental illnesses any different than they treat other diseases. And so if a doctor tells you that you need to go into a program for six months uh, and then to go back and see your doctor for checkups every month, and then if, if the problem, if, whatever is required, uh, uh, insurance companies will pay for. When that happens, then there'll be an incentive for programs that are out there right now doing little more than than babysitting people at best. I mean, there were programs where Nick went into programs where basically the treatments involved him being yelled at, um, and you know if he didn't follow the rules, uh, you know punished. You know, one one place he was literally on the floor, his hands and knees scrub, scrubbing uh, the grout and tiles in the bathroom with a toothbrush because he was breaking the rules. Uh, uh, so when insurance companies are paying for treatment, they are going to want um, results. And so there will be a new bar of what treat what treatments are required and there will be um, follow-up and there will be a requirement for licensing and monitoring of these programs. Uh, so there's hope that this will improve the treatment system. Um, the, the only other thing I was going to say, there's, there's, there's um, the other thing and maybe the thing that makes me the most optimistic things finally can change from being this, just this, this catastrophe, this unending catastrophe is that something else that I've seen as I've traveled around the country and I've met people um, and I've visited rehab programs and, and uh, hospitals and parent groups and schools and, and uh, groups of, of grieving moms and um, over and over again I see and I hear people saying the same thing. They were saying, we are tired of hiding what we've been going through. We will no longer hide in the shadows, in the darkness. This has to change. And there are organizations, there are sort of grassroots organizations that are, um, I was just in Dallas, and there's a group of parents who started an organization that's all about um, figuring out ways to actually prevent drug use instead of doing the same old things over and over again that we've been doing forever that don't work. Um, uh, in um, in Los Angeles, in St. Louis, there was this group of parents who's, uh, all these parents, is, these, all the parents who started this organization, they've all lost their kids. Um, they're tirelessly going to be working so that this does not happen to other parents. There's a new national organization that is being founded that is sort of being mirrored on the American Cancer Society, sort of like an American Addiction Society that's going to try to bring these people together. Um, because there's a, you know, with, with um, uh, we, we, I lived in San Francisco in the 1980s when the AIDS 
crisis hit, um, and that some of my dearest friends died. And, and there was an awareness in the community there that, that this was not going to change if we allow it to change. Uh, there was the campaign that made a huge difference. It was, you know, silence equals death. Um, and silence equals death, you know, with addiction, too. Um, we can no longer be silent. We have to demand money uh, that's being earmarked right now. We're spending about $25 billion a year on America's drug problem. $1 billion. $1 billion goes to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is where all of the, almost all the research and the treatments that actually could save lives. So, so 1 25th of this budget, I mean, we are not going to accept that any longer. We are going to, there are petitions, there's marches, um, uh, there's an organization right now that uh, I talked to people today that are, um, that are they're, they're working for this legislation. I've, I've written about it, it's gonna be um, in the paper on, on Monday about these, um, these Good Samaritan laws, so that right now kids are dying. If, if a child is, um, is uh, this, if, if a kid is um, overdose, uh, overdose deaths right now are the number one killer of, uh, of, of uh, in, in America. Overdose mostly on prescription medications. Um, uh, the one the number one accidental killer. It's no longer car accidents. It's it's the overdose on on prescription medications. Um, so many times somebody dies um, because they're with friends or friends. I don't know, with, uh, <coughs> And they pass out, they overdose, and nobody calls 911 because they're scared. Um, and people die over and over and over again. There is a movement now going across the country. It's been passed now in 10 states. Uh, Good Samaritan laws that will protect someone to, from calling 911 and saving their life. Um, anyway, there's, there's, there's a disaster, there's a horror. Um, and there's also hope. And there's hope, ultimately, um, because of what we know from science. There's hope because of the numbers. Uh, we have an economic crisis. People cannot any longer, you know, we can't afford to be spending uh, $400 billion a year, almost half a trillion dollars a year on something that's preventable. But most of all, there's hope because, as I said, people are going to say uh, enough. Uh, we will no longer tolerate this disease being ignored. We are going to talk about it. We are not going to stop until things change. Yeah. Well, thank you. Is, is, is any, uh, does anyone have questions? Uh, anyone have anything to say um, about this? Uh, yes, thanks. Do you think looking back and having high science, do you think there's anything that we could have done that would stop Nick from that spiral and get so wet Well, the question is if there's anything I could have done to have caught this problem before uh, Nick's spiral downward began. Um, yes, the, 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 one, of the whole, one of the things I figured out as I was going forward, as I, as I, um, real, when I was trying to understand why are we so bad at preventing this disease? Why are we so bad at stopping it when someone starts using, stopping it from progressing? Um, is because we think, about, we think about it completely wrong, and we think about, you know, this, we're telling, we're, we're focusing on drugs. We're telling kids to say no. We're saying don't use. We're trying to scare them. Um, that hasn't worked. Uh, it certainly didn't work for me in trying to stop Nick. Uh, when we start to now look instead about, instead of, uh, when we're focusing on drugs, we're supposed to, we're, instead if we start focusing on why people use, then we actually can make a difference. Um, there are, you know, there's a, one, a big part of the research I found out is, is part of what the scientists have all figured out is that it's not um, random that people end up, it can happen to anybody, but there are reasons that, many, that some people become addicted and some uh, are less likely to become addicted and it's because of all these various risk factors. Uh, first of all, if there's addiction or alcoholism in a family, much higher risk. Second of all, if they're a child who has depression, bipolar disorder, other psychological illnesses um, that hasn't been treated, they're much more likely to use um, drugs and have drug problems. Someone who's experienced trauma, um, a, a divorce like the one Nick experienced, um, uh, obviously traumas like, like abuse, those kinds of things. Um, so if we ever are going to prevent our kids from using drugs uh, and having drug problems, becoming addicted, uh, we have to 
replace those risk factors with protective factors. And that means if, if a kid is in a family where there's a divorce going on, get a child support. Um, rely on counselors. If somebody has, I mean, there, um, there's a doctor who said to me um, that so many, so many people who become addicted, the, the numbers vary depending on which research you look at, about 60 to even something like 80% of people who become seriously addicted uh, have other problems, have other mental illnesses, have co-occurring disorders. Nick finally was diagnosed um, when he was in his 20s with um, bipolar disorder and depression. Um, if we had, if, uh, so what this doctor said to me is, for a parent, it's like, it, it, if you think something's wrong, something's wrong. Something's probably wrong. Um, when I was talking about all my denial when Nick was growing up, um, I knew that there was something wrong. And I heard what I wanted to hear. I went, to, it's not that like I pretended that everything was fine. I did take him to counselors, I took him to doctors, but I didn't trust my instinct. When they told me that he was fine, that he was this great kid, I said, great, that's what I wanted to hear. Um, if I could have gotten Nick into the care of a psychiatrist when he was young who could have seen that he had bipolar disorder and depression, and if they could have treated it, um, who knows? But I think, and he thinks, that it would have changed everything because so much of his drug use was tied to, you know, we talk about people self-medicating. I mean, Nick was self-medicating. He was trying to feel better. Uh, when he got high, when he used meth or heroin, um, that, you know, that crazy anxiety that comes with bipolar disorder or that deep, deep, dark depression that he felt that he was really good at, you know, hiding, but that he felt inside, that lifted away. And so that was absolutely part of his, uh, his, his problem. And, and so, you know, if, if, so the answer is, you know, who knows? But I, if I could do it again, I certainly would not have rested in, without um, exploring all of those issues. Also, you know, when his mom and I got divorced, um, it was really hell for him. And so many parents get divorced, it's not an uncommon thing. You know, um, does that mean parents should stay together so their kids don't become drug addicts? Well, of course not. Um, but what it does mean is that divorce is really traumatic for kids. More than, some kids more than others. Some kids sail through and they're fine. It was not easy for Nick. It was hell for Nick. Um, we should have gotten him a different kind of support. And maybe if we sort of, you know, had done all those kinds of things, maybe, maybe it would have been, uh, maybe he wouldn't have, 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 have had to go through what he went through. <coughs> Did you have any um, information, or do, how do you feel about some of the treatments that they are doing now, meaning methadone and Suboxone? Did you, did you find out some stuff about that? So the, the question is, what about some of the treatments that are being used, um, methadone, Suboxone in particular? Uh, well, one of the problems with the drug treatment system that I found that Nick was, you know, I was throwing Nick into these programs where there was nobody on their staff, in some of these places, some places, there were exceptions. There were some good people that were trained. I mean, everybody was, there were all good people who really wanted to help him, but a lot of the people just didn't know what they were doing. They were in the field because they had gotten sober and they were trying to help other people, but, um, but they were part of the tradition that um, had all these prejudices about, about just because they didn't know. And so one of the sort of the standard things that were said over and over again was that, you know, you don't treat drug, program, drug problems with drugs. Um, it's, this is a chemical problem, and the research has shown that certain, medica certain addictions respond better to medications, pharmacology, than anything else. Um, I've, I've especially opiate addictions, um, that the, the, the statistics show that if a person has a, a heroin addict, uh, or an addict who's some, uh, off the, you know, a big addiction now is related to other opiate, uh, opiate drugs like, like Oxycontin and Vicodin and things like that, um, if a person goes into treatment, then w without using medications for those drugs, I mean for, for those opiates, um, about 80% of them will relapse uh, over the course of a year. Um, if they're being treated with Suboxone or Methadone, and in addition to that, they're in the care of a doctor throughout that whole period of time, the reverse statistic, 80% will stay sober. It's a huge, huge difference. A doctor told me, um, Dr. Eastley told me that he will not treat a patient. He thinks it's unethical. He thinks it's unethical for a doctor to treat an opiate addict without using those medications. Uh, they don't work for everybody. There are side effects. They're dangerous. It's really important that some people uh, uh, are wary of 
these drugs because they're not administered correctly. You've got to be working with the doctor consistently. It has to be monitored. There has to be blood testing to make sure that there's no toxicity. But um, but they're part of an arsenal of treatments that work and that people need to have, um, have access to. Possibly why I'm sure saying. Uh, number one, I want to say thank you. You've been a great ally since uh, our son Nick got in trouble as well. And in our family, the, the oddest thing is he had read Sweet before I got to be a boy. And when he brought Sweet to me, he said, Yeah, this is me. So it was a very interesting thing. Uh, his use began in eighth grade, uh, Robo. The school site had trouble with a bunch of kids on Robo, and they didn't inform parents. And that's, that's one of the most difficult things. In Marin County, not many people know how many kids we've lost in the last six months. It's tremendous. And it's kids away at UCSB or Chico State who don't come home. And so I think this is something we really just have to tackle much harder. Uh, I, you know, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. on Valley is the parent Eleanor meeting, about 250 parents in the room struggling with oxyheroin. Oxyheroin is a lot of work for Uh Gateway drug has been an ongoing question. A lot of people who poo gateway drugs, but can you address that a little bit as far as what you found in your research? <laughs> well, first of all, Mark, if you couldn't hear him in the back, um, it, was a, it was a shout out for a Saturday morning uh, Al-Anon meeting in Mill Valley that um, is for parents. And it's, uh, I, I've been, and it's, um, it's if, if for people who are suffering, I, I resisted going to Al-Anon. Uh, I thought it was too cool. I thought it was too, like, oh my God, I'm some fun stuff, sort of whiny, whatever. Um, and I, I, people told me when this was happening over and over again to go to al and I dismissed them, but I, at a certain point I was in just a measure of how much pain I was in, I would have done anything. And so I did go to uh, al and it was exactly where I needed to be. Um, it certainly didn't solve all the problems, but it, I was with people who understood what I was going through because they were going through it too. Um, and there's a meeting for parents in Mill Valley that is extraordinary, 250 people, like I said. His question was, uh, Growing up as I did, we have a lot of cynicism about all the messages that we get about drugs um, because we heard them over and over again and we sort of rolled our eyes and while they were telling us about you know, the harms of marijuana, um, uh, we were kind of rolling our eyes and we were stoned. Um, uh, and one of the things that they told us over and over again was that you know, marijuana was a gateway drug. Uh, and the, the, it, it, and it's, so, it's such an important, I mean, all these issues around marijuana are so complicated and they're so important right now because it is what everyone is talking about in America and certainly in California and it's what our kids are talking about. Um, I was, I've been, you know, I've done some work in the school in Oakland. And you can talk to the kids about drugs, they'll, they'll sort of acknowledge that heroin is and crack are dangerous, some of them. Um, but when you talk about pot, it's the opposite. It's kind of, it's normal. I mean, it's natural, it's harmless, no one's ever died. Um, it's not a gateway drug. Uh, but the, 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 the fact is, um, uh, the fact is, is that marijuana is not harmless. Um, I, I support legalization, I make a big case for why in my book, but it's not because I say marijuana is harmless. It's, it's dangerous for kids. It's, kids' brains are developing from when they're, you know, teenagers through when they're about 25 years old or whatever, um, and marijuana has an impact on that development. Um, and it affects, it can affect, depending on use, depending on the person, it can have an impact on cognitive, you know, it, it has a big impact, memory, all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, this idea that if you tell kids, you know, if, if, but this idea that marijuana is a gateway drug, you know, the idea of dismissing that is really easy to do. Uh, because the truth is we all know that most people who start smoking pot are not going to end up in the gutter um, shooting heroin. But, it's also disingenuous because I have never met anybody who's addicted who didn't start with pot and, and liquor, you know, drinking. Um, and so the point here is that, uh, you know, we have to be, we, we have to, in order to have credibility, we have to be honest with our kids, so we have to tell them the truth. Uh, so to tell them, you know, if you smoke that joint, you're going to become a heroin addict. I mean, it, it, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for, it's, it's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, but there's information that kids have to have, and one of them is, um, you know, kids are smart. If we talk down to them, if we, um, they're not going to listen to us, but if we give them information, if we give them facts, I mean, there are these amazing things on, online, these, um, they show, you know, the impact of, of drugs on, on brains of different drugs, and it, 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 
you look at this stuff and it's real and you can't deny it and you know it doesn't mean you know you give him information our kids are going to make their choices um, but this idea of, of, of marijuana being a gateway drug well the truth is is that it's not usually a gateway drug or it's not often a gateway drug but it is sometimes and it is for some reasons that are um, you know if you're once you start once a kid starts smoking pot, first of all, there's a barrier that's down. There's research that shows this, that they're more likely to try other drugs. They're more likely to be in situations where someone's going to hand them a pill. Um, and they're you know, the same person that maybe is giving them pot. I mean, there's, there's, it's, 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 um, it's just a lot of, it's the same idea. You know, marijuana is not addictive. Well, it's not true. There are about 10% of people who end up in treatment or dead because of marijuana addiction. Um, and it's not because they overdose on marijuana and die, like you can overdose on, on alcohol or on, on heroin. But um, when you know people who are uh, who are stoned are twice as likely to get in a fatal car accident than people who aren't. So, so all this stuff is much more complicated than um, than the people in this debate about legalization often uh, allow. Another Maybe question one or two too? more. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Sorry. You probably know David Kessler. Uh, David Kessler, okay, former head of the FDA, wrote a book, The End of Overeating. And I would just put out for everyone to know that he says that fat, salt, and sugar in combination is just as addictive to your brain as heroin and alcohol. So I think of the way we're eating as creating the addictive pattern that underlies why people aren't getting well. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I, do, I, I read about this idea that there's sort of the, well, basically there is an addictive pathway as people talk about, whether it's addiction, whether it's, uh, whether it's addiction to drugs, whether it's addiction to gambling, to sex, uh, food, sugar, it all works on the same pathway. And there, I, I don't know enough about it to really even talk about it much, but there's a lot of research, there's a lot of people that are talking about the connection to those problems and that we're not going to fix one problem if we're also not addressing the other one. Hi, I was just wondering, I opened your book and looked at it a little bit, and you refer to AA and that it's not really um, as beneficial for everybody, that there is a, a big wide gap. Can you talk about that? Um, the, the question about AA um, is, is uh, it is, first of uh, AA is, uh, it's, it's profound, it's, it's miraculous. Um, uh, so, somebody I quote in the book, Scott Peck, the guy who wrote um, The Road Less Travel, he said that, you know, that it would be hard to name another sort of creation in the last hundred years that has had an impact. And it's sort of a miracle because it's, you know, no one makes money from it. It's free. It's ubiquitous. I mean, anywhere you can, you know, there's a meeting probably happening right now within a half a mile of here. Um, and it saves so many lives. Um, the problem that I have with AA is not about AA, it's about a treatment, a treatment system in America that has become uh, so reliant on AA that it insists that AA is the only way, that 12 steps are the only way for people to get sober and to stay sober. Uh, at least 90%, maybe even 95% of the treatment programs that are out there uh, not only offer AA, which is, you know, AA should be offered, but it's a, it require, they require AA. And the problem with that is that if you've got um, somebody, somebody comes into treatment and they get it and it works for them, it will change their life. Um, but more, it, it, doesn't, it, it will not work for many people. In fact, it won't work for more people than it works for. All the research shows that. So if you send somebody into a treatment program, you spend, okay, you send a kid, especially, okay, most people who become addicted start using when they're teenagers. Um, you send a teenager into a program, uh, they don't really, believe they're addicted, they're just having, you know, they're just using and they're getting into trouble and their parents are being, you know, whatever and they're, you know, making them go into this stupid program. And, and then they, and you get in the program and basically the programs that Nick was in and there's so many of the programs out there, it's all about you have to accept um, that you are powerless over your addiction and you have to turn your life over to a higher power. Um, being a teenager is, in some ways, anathema to that whole idea. You know, teenagers are not going to turn their life over to anybody. Uh, and so you put these kids into these programs, and they are yelled at, and they're threatened, and say, if you don't do it this way, you're going to die. You're going to. And, and some programs, Nick was kicked out of a program because he was too belligerent. He didn't follow the twelve steps. Um, and sometimes he then would reject the program, and he would leave. And then there, a lot of times, people. I've heard this again, over and over again, from parents. My kid went into one program. 
another program, another program. He finally just gave up. Nothing was going to help me because that's what the rehab counselors were saying. So AA is, pro AA is profound. It is one of many other treatment programs, uh, many treatments that work, and all people should have the options, should be, be given um, whatever they need. You know, people are all different. Uh, some people respond to AA, some people respond to medications, some people need therapy and medications, and AA, some people, it's, it's different for everybody. Um, so, Oh, I didn't oh. Want to talk about this before we go to sign? What we're handing out tonight? Um, I would. I will not talk about this only because this was wow. taken down. Oh. I, there was a well. There's, there will be a new petition uh, <laughs> that is. Uh, anyway, there's been some stuff. The Obama administration, this the president administration this week, made some announcements about um, a new tap on drug policy, which um, they said everything that should be said. They said that we need to treat this as a health problem, not a criminal problem. Um, there are a couple things that they've actually changed, but most things have not changed. So we are going to create a petition that addresses this. But there is something else that, um, uh, I guess it's, it, I don't have them there. I mentioned that there is sort of a version of the American Cancer Society, but it's, it's the American Addiction Association. It's got a different name. Um, it's it's uh, being founded by this man who is a remarkable man whose son died. And he was ready, basically, he was going to kill himself. He said, I cannot survive my son's death. Um, and finally, he decided that the only way he was going to survive was uh, to try to help other parents from, to save other parents from going through what he did. And so he is a big businessman. He quit his job. And he's devoting all of his life to try and start this organization. Um, it's called Brian's Wish to End Addiction. Um, if, on my website, there's a link to it. And if you go there, and sign up there to be part of the launching of this organization. It is, it's going to be profound. Um, if, if I, in the book, I write a lot about you know how influential the American Cancer Society is. The fact that about 20 percent fewer people die of cancer now than they died of, than they did about 20 years ago. So many different things that that we take for granted. The packet um, warnings on cigarette packets. Uh, some of the big um, cancer treatments like interferon, things like that, were all came out of money and research and education by the American Cancer Society. Well, this American Addiction Society is going to take that on finally, and it's going to have an enormous impact. So please sign up, get more information, and uh, stay involved with them as well. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you all. If you have a book, please come on up to Center Isle. If you don't, they're available at all the registers. Well, thank you. Yeah, see you. Bye, thanks.